Good morning, Crossings. I'm Randy Webb, and I'm here today with Adam Luck, the CEO of CityCare. And we're here today to tour this awesome facility and see a little bit about what CityCare does here in our community. Explain to us a little bit about CityCare and what yes. happens with CityCare and then why we're standing here in this night shelter. Yes, so CityCare's got a couple different programs, but our mission, we exist to inspire those willing to look social injustice and extreme poverty in the face and empower them to do whatever it takes to create change. So externally in the community, what we want to do is meet people where they're at, but we also want to empower them, right? So we want to educate them. We want to provide them with the resources to go out in the community and create the change that they believe needs to take place. Most often we are meeting people and so some of their deepest, darkest moments. And in those moments, we might be the only people that see them for their potential and set up for their past. And we want to inspire them with what life could be like. But again, we don't just want to leave them there, we want to empower them. Right. So we're giving them the education and the resources right. and the services for them to create the change that they want to see in their own lives. So that plays out through, like I said, a couple different programs. We've got a supportive housing program um, of 115 units of housing here in this neighborhood. We currently operate the Oklahoma City Day Shelter in partnership with the Homeless Alliance. And then, uh, of course, we have the WizKids program, which you all have been longtime faithful partners of. Here today, we're standing in what will be Oklahoma City's only low barrier night shelter. And really what low barrier means is that anybody can come. So we don't create any barriers to access services, which we believe is really important. So what that means practically is that they don't have to have an ID to access services. They don't have to enroll in a program. They can just stay one night if that's all they want to stay. Um, they don't have to be sober. And so many times, those are the hardest people to serve. And so what we want to do is meet them where they're at, provide them with them some services so that maybe eventually they can consider sobriety or employment or making a transition out of homelessness. And so we see at the day shelter that that has really been beneficial for us to take that position of, of maintaining that low barrier status. I'm just so happy that you guys are being Jesus' hands and feet to our community and helping out those where they're at and loving on the least of these. Mm -hmm. And so one thing we do at Crossings is we have a dollar club. Every week we pass the offering plates, people put dollars in, and then we collect that together and we give it to someone who's doing great things here in our city like City Care. Mm -hmm. So today, what I'd like to do is present you with a check to help you start, oh, you so to help you start the night shelter mm -hmm. with the 200 beds, mm -hmm. the blankets, and mm -hmm. a whole month's worth of meals oh my gosh. for the people who will be Thank living here. Thank you so here. much. Thank so you we so appreciate much. what you're doing. Gosh, well, we just, I mean, we're so grateful for your all's partnership. We're so grateful to be in a position to even call this work and do this in the community. And uh, we're just excited to do it alongside you all. So thank you so much. Thank you. That's pretty amazing. 200 beds and meals for a month and the bedding to go with it. Thank you for those dollar bills. I'm so thankful for that. You know, I'm, I've, I know I've said this quite a bit, but it's our 60th year. I want to keep saying it to make sure everybody hears it because we're the recipients of generosity, a, a, a biblical generosity that's been practiced in this church since day one in 1959. And in all 60 years, our, our leaders made two decisions. One is no debt. The other is we're going to tithe on your tithe. And so we're a tithing church. And so whatever you give, we give 10%. We set it aside and we send it out. In addition to the dollar club and other things that you sometimes want to participate in in our missions ministries. So thank you for your generosity. And if, once, if we're just doing what God has told us to do with our tithe, there's amazing things that can happen for the purposes of God on this earth and in this city. So thank you so much for all that and the ability we have to, uh, to do things with this dollar, these dollar bills like you just saw on the uh, screens. One of the things we're going to be doing during our 60th anniversary as a church, we're gonna turn the focus uh, today into a, its Voice of Hope. Uh, we, li we Live by Faith is our first segment, Voice of Hope is the second, Known by Love will be the last one starting September 1st through the end of the year. We're gonna be asking everyone, whether it's individuals or families or small groups or a Sunday school class, find a way to serve somewhere in our community during this season, this summer and early fall. There'll be opportunities to serve one time, just a few hours, all the way to serve consistently if you wanna get there, or serve four or five weeks. You really get to pick whatever works best for your schedule at this point, but let's just make sure we do it. We're gonna do a project for single moms that's gonna take 600 volunteers. So just be following that away, and we'll let you know uh, when and uh, we're thankful that we can be doing that. 
Thank you to all. I'm thankful for all the folks joining us uh, out in Edmond and those gathered here in Oklahoma City in the atrium in the venue and uh, the chapel service. And then uh, my brother's down at Joseph Harp. Uh, we're going to spread some hope this afternoon. Uh, we're heading down to Joseph Harp. A bunch of us are going and uh, going to lead a service, have an outdoor. We're going to have a revival service. I mean, I'm going to go full on Baptist tonight. And uh, they really taught us how to do that really well, okay? So, I mean, we're going to be in a tent. We're going to have hundreds of guys sitting there. And we're going to do some singing and some preaching and some praying. And uh, we're, it's celebrating one year at Joseph Harp. And so we're so thankful for that. So, I'll never forget, uh, many, many years ago, I, it probably was over 25 years ago, I remember uh, our, our two, first two kids, Tyler and Kristen, were very young. And uh, I, we'd gone to California to visit my dad and my family out there, and my California family, as I call them. And dad had arranged to take us all up to LA and uh, in this magnificent theater and see this Broadway production of Les Miserables. And, uh, and my, I, the, I remember two things about the night. One is I remember I just was terrified that we had come to California. We'd left our two small children with a babysitter we'd never met. Now dad said they're good, you know. So, and, and well, there's another story to that too, but dad said they'll be fine. They were out there at the house and all that. So I remember that drive up to LA about 30 minutes and it's like, oh dear God, protect my children tonight. You know, they're still young and you know, you're still afraid of everything in the world for your kids. So I remember that part of it. But more importantly, I remember seeing this, this musical production that I've since seen several times. It's fantastic. You can rent the movie. It's really a great movie. There's a phrase, there's a great song in there, I Dreamed a Dream. It's one of the most memorable for me. But there's a piece in this mus musical that's not so pretty and not so happy. And in fact, there's a couple of moments in this production and in, in the movie too that are just heartbreaking. So the one that feels hope is lost and she says, but the tigers come at night with their voices soft as thunder as they tear your hope apart and they turn your dream to shame. But there are dreams that cannot be and there are storms we cannot weather. I had a dream. My life would be so different from the hell I'm living so different from now, from what it seemed, now life has killed the dream I dreamed. We have a great opportunity in this community to be hope givers, to truly be voices of hope. And we don't just say that because we want to be known by it. We, we, we don't just be printed in, on the walls and on paper and wherever people hear it. We'd rather people see it in action. Of course, we're going to have that, an opportunity for all of us and all our locations to be able to engage in our community in some significant ways that have been prepared for us throughout this summer and into the fall. I want to take you back to the beginning of hope. Where did it come from? Jesus tips his hand a bit in the New Testament. In fact, let me just read the text in Matthew 22, and I'm starting at verse 34 says the Pharisees got together and one of them, an expert in the law, tested him. We've heard that a lot. They were always testing Jesus. They tested him with this question, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. I'm going to, I want to repeat that. You've got to get, I want you to grasp this. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here, but we need to get this clear. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second, Jesus said, is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law of the prophets hang on these two things. I think sometimes we miss 
the vital importance of what Jesus has just said. The Ten Commandments, we're familiar with the law, of course, and by the time of Christ, there were 600 some laws that were supposed to be followed and obeyed, which were impossible to even remember, let alone obey them. But there were those called hypocrites who uh, were the religious elite who led everybody to believe that they knew those laws and could live them out flawlessly, which is impossible. And they were going to make sure that no one else would ever be able to aspire to their greatness. And that's when God said, I've had enough of this, and he sent Jesus Christ to get this clear, set the record straight to free us from that oppression. But we go back to the book of Exodus, and we get the Ten Commandments, for example. And I, I think this is interesting. You may not, but I sure do, and I'm going to say it. So <laughs> I thought, I, this is really interesting to me, so you're going to learn how just simple my brain is. So, so look at the, nobody's shocked by that one. So the 10 commandments, <laughs> no other gods, real straightforward, real simple. One God, one father of us all, no idols. I would say that's probably the toughest one for the human race these days, because we find a whole lot of things to worship our stuff, ourselves. We're so absorbed in ourselves. To misuse, commandment number three, misuse or disrespect God's name. There's so much more to that verse than sometimes I think we grasp. Because I think if we fully grasp it, we'd be careful what we said using the word God. Commandment four, remember the Sabbath. Commandment five, honor your father and mother. Do not commit murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not give false testimony about a neighbor, do not covet. So Christ came because these commandments had been turned into the impossible demands of, of the religious elite of that day. Paul says in Colossians 2, verse 13 to 15, he forgave our sins, look at this, having canceled the written code with all its regulations and nailed them, our sins, to the cross. Paul says in Romans 6, 14, for sin shall not be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. Now, Paul is not saying we throw away the moral code, not at all. He's saying that new life in Christ now is not governed by external legal observances or by obedience to this external code. Life in Christ is now an inward relationship with God through the power of the Holy Spirit, which we talked about last week, the spirit that God sent us, Jesus as he promised us, gave it the Holy Spirit to us at Pentecost. But the law condemns, but grace enables. In other words, the Old Testament laws were, I have to do this. Now there's plenty of that to the, to the law, don't get me wrong. I have to do this. In Christ, I want to do that. I want to live like that. I want that to, to define my life. So we desire to love and obey God because of his great love for us. So grace enables us then and gives us the desire to live differently. That's what we do. He did not come to make us feel better about our messed up lives, our messed up thoughts, the habits that are destroying us. He did not come to mark those off, say, well, I'm under grace, so it doesn't matter. No, 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 no. That's just cheap grace, that's, that's abusing, that's manipulating God in, in, in fact. That's a dangerous place to be. No, no, he came to put his spirit inside of us to help us then live what he's called us to live, to give us the desire because we love him so much, we want to do the very best we can to live the kind of life he's called us to live that he says is possible in the scriptures. Now here's what's interesting. Notice something in all the commandments. No, notice this. They're all about a relationship, all of them. So no other gods, because there's only one God. No idols. No, no idols. We don't want, he doesn't want us focused on everything else. It's to be focused on him. That's a relationship with him. Not misusing and disrespecting God's name. That has a lot to do with how we are known in the community, how people know us, that we love God so much we would never badmouth his name. 
And then what about remembering the Sabbath? Is there a downside? Let me ask you a question for a minute. And, and I'm as guilty as anybody in the room on what I'm getting ready to say. So don't let me sit here and make you believe that I've got this figured out. Can you imagine if we still had enough sense in this world to have a Sabbath? To stop the noise, to stop the world, and not just give him one single hour on a Sunday morning. What about giving him 24? Just one, is, is one day asking too much? He put the Sabbath in place for a reason to rest and reflect and be prepared for what's next. Boy, that was just all about our relationship with him and him protecting us and helping us be the kind of people he called us to be. Honor your father and mother. Can you imagine if everybody believed that and practiced it? Wouldn't it be awesome if every father and mother was worthy of being honored? What's, what about the next one? Do not murder. That's pretty obvious. Do not commit adultery. Why would he mention that one? Was well, there any other relationship killer you can think of that cuts more deep? That's all about a relationship. I, I don't want to do that. One, I love my wife. But one, I'm, I'm going to serve God. And therefore, why would I do that? It's about relationship. Do not steal. We don't want to take something that doesn't belong to us. Something that is not rightfully ours. Because somebody gets hurt when we take something that doesn't belong to us. What about false testimony about a neighbor? Oh man, come on. How, sure, I want to ask for a show of hands. My, mine are up, so take. <laughs> I, I'll do it for you. How many times have we just found such joy in passing along a little dirt? And it might even be true, but a lot of times we don't know the whole truth, but we love the juicy story of passing it along. Sometimes I get around other pastors, which is very rarely, because it's not pleasant. And so they love talking about the latest pastor that's blown up and failed and his church is destroyed. I go, really? Why don't we just get on our knees and pray for this person instead of just give this false, we don't know the facts and do not covet. Because God has promised, I'm gonna give you the life you could never have dreamed of. Why do you keep looking over the fence for something you don't have? Why do we want, I want what they've got. I, I, I want to be like them. I want to be like her. Why do we do that? Are, are, we, are we looking at God and going, God, you gypped me in this deal called life. And we turn somebody into an idol of sorts by coveting their life and what they have and how they're viewed and how their children are viewed and all those things. Every one of those is about a relationship. Every one of them. There's no downside to any of those. Those all make perfect sense. Every one of those 10, it's all perfectly common sense, and you know it. So Jesus comes along, and he was asked, teacher, what's the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Those two commandments are the key to living out the 10 we just looked at and more. How can we be a voice of hope? A couple of quick things. I've made just a little bit of room for you to write this down on your, on your note page. One is we've got to have our hope in Jesus to start with. If we're going to be a voice of hope, if we're as a church lifting up, exalting Christ, a Christ-centered church, then we've got to be Christ-centered people. And Christ-centered people are eager to share the hope that we have in Christ. So we put our hope in Christ. That's what I've been, I'm going to say it every week as, as, unless I forget it. And I will. But I mean, I want everybody that hears my voice, that walks into the doors of our churches, our locations, I want everybody to understand until you have put Jesus at the center of your life, you have put him first, and you, you know what that hope is all about, and until everyone, as much as I can do, until everyone knows that and chooses Jesus 
I'm not going to quit saying it. And the reason I'm telling you that is really for one, one reason, well, a couple of reasons. One is I want you to be right with God. But secondly, that decision makes everything else in life so much different and so much better. Putting Jesus at the center, there's no downside. I mean, just look at what Jesus really said to us. Look at what he asked for. Look at what he intended. There's no downside. So we want to put him at the center. We want to put our hope in Jesus. Hebrews 6, 19. We have this hope. What hope? Jesus. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. You cannot give to others what you have not experienced yourself. And when we really get a grasp of what God has actually done for us, giving us the hope of Christ, hope of forgiveness, the hope of eternal life, we cannot help but want to take some hope to as many people as we can. Jesus canceled the debt of sin and gave us hope. He came into a world where there was no hope. And we're not abandoned by an angry God. Instead of trying harder now, we, we can love more because he loves us. And because of his love, we live the life he's called us to live to start with, with his spirit at work inside of us. The psalmist says in Psalm 62, 5, let all that I am wait quietly for my hope is in him. That'd be a great little prayer to add to your, to your list for the mornings. Lord, today, let, let all that I am wait quietly before you, for my hope is in you. It's a good way to start a day to remember, he's got this. Let all that I am wait quietly. Two things we've lost <laughs> the ability and interest to do. Wait and quiet. Let all that I am wait quietly before God, for my hope is in him. And this is why we wanna be a voice of hope to our city and our world. We know the hope giver. So we put our hope in Christ. Secondly, if we're going to be a voice of hope, we, we use the gifts and abilities he's given us. We use whatever's been put in us and in our hands for the good of others. We are all given gifts and abilities, all of us. A lot, everybody has some natural talent, something they're good at that they learned, they excelled at, and they do that thing really well, whatever that is. But beyond just being given certain gifts, spiritual gifts, frankly, God wants to use us at times, and it may be out of our comfort zone, and it may not be in line with what my particular gifts and skills are. And that's what it's going to take for us to be a voice of hope, to say, I don't know what I can do, but I'm going to show up, and I'm going to see if I can be helpful. And I'll promise you 99.99% .99 of the time, you're going to be helpful. You've been nudged. You've been nudged by something far more powerful, by the Holy Spirit himself, said you need to go, you need to go over there, you need to see what's going on, you need to live it, experience it, and see it, even if it's for one hour. We use the gifts he's given us, the things he's put in our hands for the good of others. Now listen, I know I'm talking to a church that does this really well. So I'm not necessarily saying we... We're losing ground somewhere. I'm just saying I would love everybody that's part of this body of believers have their hope in Christ and then to begin using the gifts he's put in us that we're to use for the common good, the scripture says. Ephesians chapter th uh, 2, verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, created, look at this, created, why? Created in Christ Jesus to do good works to do good things. We've been created to do that, to be hope givers, to put our faith in action. What we believe should impact what we do and how we do it and what we say. So we put our hope in Christ, we use what he's put in our hands and our, in our gifts for his purposes, and then third, we serve one another. We just start serving each other. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself. And, and a lot of times we do exactly what the young uh, uh, guy that asked Jesus, oh, uh, well, who's my neighbor? The Pharisee that asked Jesus, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus did, taught him several things about understanding who's your neighbor 
the one standing right next to you, the one close by, the one that needs you the most in that moment. We serve one another in love. And as we serve one another, as the commandment says, as we love our neighbor as ourselves, then we're to do, do it in a certain way. Ephesians 6, 7, and 8 says it this way. Serve wholeheartedly as if you're serving the Lord, not man. Because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good we do. I think in this moment, this is where we, we decide we're gonna stop making ourselves our idol and worshiping ourselves and worshiping the mirror. We're, we're gonna stop using people for our own agendas and serve them instead. This is where we get away from the hyper focus of materialism and wanting more, from impressing people with what you've got, from always craving more and more and more and more of whatever it is you crave. We get the focus off ourselves, we serve wholeheartedly because we want to do that for a God that loves us in ways we cannot even begin to express. The Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, Paul says in Ephesians 6. As we enter into this season, the voice of hope, the first sec section is now over, the first four months. We're not gonna stop living by faith. We, not that we're only gonna do that from January to April. Now we're gonna quit living by faith for a while. That's danger. Whew, can you imagine? No, no, we, but we put our focus on it. We celebrated a couple of great steps of faith. One is certainly starting a, a church location inside the prison. Another one is certainly having the courage to at least go take a look at 36 and Walker, first Christian, see if, if this is what God has in mind. We don't know yet. It's a step of faith. So now we're gonna focus on being that voice of hope between now and the end of September. And Pam Millington, our, our pastor over all the mission efforts, has done a phenomenal job preparing us for kind of a summer of service. Uh, we're gonna have work days with all of our inner city schools, the partners that we, the schools that allow us in. Uh, it's a, a, an organization called She Builds. We'll be doing a total makeover of three homes for single moms who own these properties. We're, that's when we're gonna need 600 people, 600 volunteers to, to rework or make over three homes. Now, believe me, I'm gonna to go to those. I'm gonna show up. But I'll promise you, they do not want a hammer in my hand. <laughs> Nothing good can come from that. <laughs> I promise you. They don't want a saw in my hand. That's not a good thing either. But boy, I can, I can dig a hole. I can stir concrete. I, you know, There's things we'll do. All of you all that are dangerous with tools, you can join me and we'll, we'll make a big impact. Now, there's just a couple of things we're gonna do in this 60th anniversary year. And you can go out to the 60th anniversary uh, table out in the atrium and out in the foyer in Edmond, and there's people there after the services, they're gonna answer your questions, they'll give you opportunities, tell you what's involved. You can serve one time, a couple hours, you can get involved and do more. Showing up to one thing does not mean you're gonna be roped into trying to do more pressured. That's gonna have to be your call, God's gonna have to lead you to, to, do, to decide what you'll do next. But we're gonna, we're gonna deal with issues such as health care. We're already dealing with that in a significant way of the clinic, but looking at greater ways we can serve that area of our city. The demographics over there are staggering. I've read them to you before. Some of the worst uh, drug abuse, uh, uh, child abuse, poverty, hunger. I mean, literally, just a few miles over. And here we sit with the clinic right across the street. So we're gonna look into that, the, the healthcare issue, the, the helping the employment and education piece, like giving 200 beds to this shelter that'll help start perhaps the, the way back home for people that have been lost, flourishing families. Second highest number of child abuse cases in Oklahoma County, a couple of miles over. So that's what we're gonna focus on. It's our 60th anniversary. Now we've been doing this for 50, 60 years. This church has been serving in significant ways for 60 years. But we've got a lot more people now. And I don't believe God put us together in this large body of believers that we've become to not do anything. We can have a big impact if we do it together. So I'm hoping that you can be a part of it. 
So if you want to go out to uh, talk to the people in the rooms where you're gathered, uh, they'll be there to start answering your questions and, and you'll be able to find out uh, information. And that's not just today. That'll be on throughout uh, the summer. So I think I come back to what we were talking about. James 2.17 just says this. In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Personally, let me tell you something. If I was not given the opportunity, the privilege, and sometimes the need to show up some places, I'd be so consumed with life and materialism and cars. Not that I'm not right now, but <laughs> just keep praying. But every time I leave those situations all frequently where there's a need and we've been a part of it in some way, I think, dear Lord, that's why you put us on this planet. Forgive me for forgetting that. Forgive me for being so self-absorbed. Forgive me and wanting all the comforts. There's people in this town that don't have enough food or a place to sleep. In the same way, faith, and I got a lot of faith, as a believer for a long, long time. But if it's not accompanied by action, it's dead. Mother Teresa, to me, one of the greatest missionaries, talk about complete abandonment to the world and serving in the way God wanted to use her. Here's what she said. There's so much suffering in the world, physical, material, mental. The suffering of some can be blamed on the suffering from hunger, from homelessness, from all kinds of diseases. But the greatest suffering is being lonely, feeling unloved, having no one. I've come more and more to realize that it's being unwanted that is the worst disease that any human being can ever experience. If we're gonna be hope givers, I think that's what God called a church to do. We're gonna be hope givers. We're gonna share in all of our rooms communion and we'll have a chance to hold in our hands the symbols of the one who gave us hope, Jesus Christ, by giving his body on a cross. We call the ushers forward in all of our rooms. If you'll uh, come to the front of your room, begin serving the congregation. We, we invite everyone to share communion with us. It has nothing to do with joining a church or being in a certain church. If you know what the bread and cup mean, and if you're willing to publicly accept the body of Christ and the blood of Christ in communion, we want you to do that with us as a family. And if you'll wait till you've all been served, and then we will share it together once uh, we've been served. Let me pray for us, and then we will continue in our communion service. Father, we're so thankful for the privilege of this place. We're thankful for the privilege of being together. We're thankful, Father, that somebody told us about Jesus. And we're thankful, Father, for this reminder in the bread and cup that there is so much more to this life than we are settling for. Father, send us, use us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.